All right, welcome back. This is the second episode I'll be posting tonight. This one is about regional groundwater flow. So when we're dealing with a groundwater basin, uh, you it's a defined volume of the subsurface through which groundwater flows from areas where the water table is recharged, such as a mountain front, to a location where the groundwater discharges. So a stream in a uh, basin a sedimentary basin is the best way to, to think about it, like a basin in range, uh, prototypical, normal faults on both sides with maybe a stream in the middle. Um, and this is called regional flow. So in the zone of actively flowing groundwater, the water moves through the porous media under the influence of fluid potential. And I'm not going to read this whole thing. It's a throwback to physics, but basically the potential is uh, what gener it refers to uh, unrealized ability um, and I bolded this part because it's a good example so a boulder on the edge of a cliff has potential energy that could be actualized by pushing uh, pushing it off the cliff and at that point it's not potential energy anymore it's mechanical energy but anyways uh, flow nets are used to uh, describe uh, regional flows and in terms of recharge versus discharge areas you have uh, well recharge areas are typically topo highs so topographic highs mountain tops um, hills and then discharge areas are topo lows such as valleys uh, yeah uh, valleys that's the best way to think about it a recharge so recharge um, talking about the deep unsaturated zone between the water table and the land surface and uh, okay sorry i'm reading that wrong <laughs> uh, so in, in deep unsaturated zone between the water table and the land surface uh, that's significant for recharge whereas discharge the water table is close to the land surface so you'll have uh, more discharge occurring uh, due to evaporation or it's closer to the surface so if you have a change in topography you can have a spring form if flow nets well in flow nets uh, recharge such as okay this is moving slow recharge they diverge so basically think of it like this at the top that's a uh, that's diverging and then discharge into the stream valley is converging those arrows, those flow net arrows, converge won't occur if the discharge zone is large, such as at a coastline. So recharge, whoops. So recharge versus discharge areas. Um, the water table contour map can be used to locate recharge and discharge zones. Uh, vegetation and surface water can be used to locate discharge zones. Um, and that's because obviously vegetation is going to grow where there's water and in an arid region as you'll see on the next slide I'll, I'll show you what that means um, but you uh, springs lakes and streams are discharge zones um, so when we're talking about surface water we're talking about springs lakes and streams so in arid regions uh, discharge occurs as evapotranspiration it's thicker than normal cover of vegetation and you might have salt deposits occur at a, uh, a discharge zone um, and a perched aquifer could lead to a wetland or pond and so this is one of my favorite places in uh, in this region of the country so Oro Grande is a very very dry place typically but it has some beautiful streams it's known for uh, its former mining district but it has some beautiful streams that cross cut it and I mean you, you can see the vegetation density occurs along where the streams are that's where the water table is most likely the highest so obviously it makes sense that vegetation is going to be at its thickest density along these uh, stream areas so in humid regions the water table follows the topography for the most part Recharge takes place in topographic highs, and it has greater potential energy than recharge in the lower areas. Um, crest of the water table in a flow net is a groundwater divide with flow on either side. 
uh, going in opposite directions. I did not picture that here. I think it's on the next slide. But uh, an intermediate, and we'll go through the, the, okay, so there's three types. There's regional flow systems, intermediate, and then local. So an intermediate flow system is, it's at least one local flow system between their recharge and discharge areas. And uh, it has properties between local and regional. So it's basically, obviously, intermediate. It's between what a local flow system is and what a regional flow system is flow system is so a flow system so a flow system um, and this is a good picture of a local flow system recharge area in the basin divide and discharge area at the va uh, valley bottom that's talking about a uh, regional it occurs here on the mountain front or top of the hill and it slowly makes its way to what is basically a lake or a river over here um, and when you're talking about a local system it's very small flow paths and close to the surface okay i'm getting ahead of myself but uh depending on the drainage basin topography and shape geometry the flow system may be regional local intermediate or well all three um and it basin depth and length ratio can uh, affect uh, which one you'll have um, more pronounced relief of undulating water table the deeper the local flow extends and I did not finish that sentence <laughs> okay I'm just continuing it on the next one okay so the regional flow system if the regional flow system develops flow paths uh, are long as you can see and these take thousands millions of years to uh, travel, uh, it's actually going uh, right to left, the, uh, the, the regional flow system. Um, it travels really deep into the, uh, into the lithosphere and comes back up. And uh, in aquifers composed of soluble, soluble rocks such as limestone, uh, the degree of mineralization is a function of chemistry of water and the length of time it is in contact with water. So if you have something, flow, uh, groundwater flowing through a regional flow system and it's flowing through limestone, it's going to be really hard water, really, really, really undrinkable water um, by the time it reaches the top. And that at that point, it could be a, a travertine deposit or it could be... Uh, could be uh, just a, a deposit of calcite um, so water moves slowly and it circulates deep and is likely to have a uh, high mineralization and high temperatures due to the geotherm obviously you go deeper into the crust the warmer it gets but also as groundwater flows through uh, rocks it heats up due to friction uh, and it's trying to overcome the friction so it's heating up that way too and when we're talking about a local flow system, it's much shallower and it has short flow paths. Its recharge area is greater in size. The shorter contact time with rocks and it's less mineralized. You have lower temperatures, which it's closer to surface temperatures. You have rapid circulation, so it's much more active in the hydrologic cycle. And uh, spring discharge of local flow related to recharge of precipitation and wide, fluctua f wide fluctuations which creates a greater disparity in water quality and this is kind of a cool uh, little uh, cross section showing three different rivers and because they're so close together it's considered a low fl uh, local flow system short paths and you have you know this is pretty interesting and eventually it reaches wetlands in this particular case from the Altamaha River so slowly makes its way to wetlands well quick quicker than a regional flow system which is shown in this confined aquifer this is a confining layer so in terms of non-cyclical groundwater you have uh, fossil water which is water buried with uh, with the wa with the rock um, you have conate water which is something you hear about when you're dealing with uh, petroleum geology that's that's water that they typically come in contact with when they're drilling for for oil. It's interstitial water that has been 
out of contact with the atmosphere for a long geologic time. And in terms of juvenile water, we're not talking about juvenile. Uh, we're talking about magmatic water, and it enters the hydro cycle through volcanism. It's coming from deep in the crust, basically. Deep in the lithosphere. Intruding magma bodies. So, um, so th these are just the different types of springs. So a depression spring is when the water table reaches the surface, as you can see pictured over here. Contact spring is when permeable rocks overlie lower permeability. In the last episode, we were talking about how that sandstone is thinned out and it's in contact with uh, the muds. That would be considered a boundary. Well, in this case, you know, you could have a spring form if it erodes in, a, in such a way that, you know, you can have water escaping, such as pictured right here. You have a fault spring, as pictured right here, that can cause a spring to form and flow. Um, well, joint and fracture spring is pictured right here, and it's similar to, uh, similar to a fault uh, spring. And then in terms of sinkhole and karst, springs you're dealing with uh, basically um, karst topographies and heavy limestone occurrences where uh, you have a lot of soluble limestones being dissolved and those will be conduits for water and uh, springs can form in that way too and that's the end of this episode i appreciate you guys watching